So my name's uh, John DL. I'm an adjunct professor at Dow, and my co-authors are Dr. Hello and uh, Tara Sherrard, who is uh, one of our recent graduates and is a research uh, associate and has done a lot of work for us. When you look at the issues of of search and rescue response. If you look at a search and rescue incident, aircraft are often the fastest means to perform the search, especially if you have AIS or an EPIRB to help pinpoint the location. However, once the survivors have been located, how do you affect the rescue? How long can an aircraft remain on scene? Sometimes survivors must wait an extended period for a surface vessel to arrive. So our question is, you know, do air deployed, remotely controlled marine craft have a role? If so, what roles would they have? What alternatives are there? Just outlining our presentation, uh, you know, the, the technologies available enabling these craft are well demonstrated over the past decade and are widely used for military, oceanographic, a few other purposes. UAVs made significant inroads into search and rescue response, especially with the ground search and rescue teams. Remotely controlled marine craft have been used to a limited extent in drowning prevention, particularly to assist with uh, beach rescues, assisting lifeguards. So this presentation will explore the potential advantages and roles of air deployed remotely controlled marine craft in remote region response. It focuses on the application of available technologies. So just going through it, we'll talk about remote regions. We'll give an example of a multiple vessel in incident. We'll talk about potential roles, some of the uh, Basic requirements are several examples of existing craft that might be suitable. Uh, very touch on some technology and of course a conclusion. So what is uh, what do we mean by a remote region? So for instance in Canada we have a very large area of, res of responsibility in our search and rescue region and fairly limited resources. Uh, the, Dictionary definition remote is far away in distance or time. And of course, for many maritime cases, uh, both apply distance and time. And the other factor, particularly in our water temperatures, is time is the enemy of us all, particularly case if you're in distress in cold waters, but any waters will certainly limit your survival time. If we look at, um, remote region issues, SAR incidents in Canada over the past, well, since 2013 to 2017, database shows these, the criteria is 100 nautical miles from the shore or north of the Arctic Circle. So you can see quite a few, for instance, off the east coast of Canada where I'm located. And as you go further north, there's more sporadic cases. And as you go up through the Arctic territory of Nunavut, you can see, uh, a fair number of cases, probably small boats or other incidents inshore. A rather tragic incident uh, occurred back in 2011. Some search and rescue technicians parachuted into the sea. You can see the red circle up north there to assist some persons uh, stranded in a small boat. The overflying aircraft uh, eventually had to depart to refuel, returning back to Winnipeg, way down in the south. And these are all big distances. And there was a loss of communications. As I read the report, there was actually a loss of communications considerably before the aircraft departed, actually. So seven hours after the aircraft departed, a helicopter arrived, a Corbett, a large helicopter, which had come from Newfoundland, which is on the lower right-hand side of that map and it had made several refueling stops and had flown 2,200 kilometers and one of the search and rescue technicians had perished. A couple of reasonably recent incidents. The top one is a fishing vessel called the Atlantic Charger. Well, she sank up off Northern Labrador 
uh, towards uh, between Labrador and Greenland, let's say. Sorry. And you uh, and the crew were well trained uh, in, in, res in survival techniques. They put on their survival suits, got in the life raft, and there were aircraft that flew over top of them from Nova Scotia down where I live, uh, perhaps 1,500 kilometers away. Um, the crew was able to get into, into uh, a life raft sorry, into the life raft. They waited for a bulk carrier came by. They didn't, they chose not to board that ship because the dangers of climbing up the side of a high wall, high sided ship. And they waited until a shrimp trawler came by and that rescued them. And another case down below is a fairly large uh, shrimp trawler, a very heavily built ice reinforced plate, maybe 30 millimeters thick, hit a, what you call a growler, which is a small piece of multi-year ice, which is very hard and flooded the ship. And, uh, Again, they flew from Greenwood here in Nova Scotia up to that area. They did drop two uh, pumps to assist them. A Danish naval vessel out of Greenland came by. It deployed its rigid hull inflatable. The rigid hull inflatable was damaged and rendered unserviceable. And uh, they eventually were able to make their way to Greenland. Now, if they had gone down, and I would say they were very, very close to that, uh, I think the outcome would have been very tragic. So as a local Arctic politician said, if we have a major incident up here, we are in a very bad position to be able to respond. So how do you provide adequate search and rescue re response resources? It's a very large area. It's far from infrastructure and any major population base. There's a lot of adverse weather and limited traffic and incidents. Other countries have similar problems. So we show the Australian search and rescue region for which they are responsible. And uh, I believe that's 10% of the Earth's surface. And we show the New Zealand search and rescue region again and some of the adjacent areas. A couple of cases from there back uh, from uh, 2018, uh, a couple of rescues from around the world races. And you can see a vessel there in the middle of the Indian Ocean who was actually, I believe he was an Indian military officer sailing a large yacht dismasted. And the Australians flew over the, over the craft and they did uh, task a French patrol boat uh, to a tent and he, they rescued him 24 hours later. And a similar story in the middle of the Southern Ocean where another yacht was severely damaged and the Chilean authorities tasked uh, a bulk carrier who actually deployed one of their cargo cranes to uh, lift her out of the water. Both had happy outcomes, both could have had different outcomes, and both of the people who were rescued were number one, lucky, and number two, you know, well trained to survive that uh, ordeal. Another very large search and rescue region is up in the Arctic. And we can see there the massive area that's the responsibility of the Russian Federation, massive areas that belong to everybody. You, you have to take into account the scales here are extremely large. You can see uh, down the lower right hand side, uh, uh, I think shows 500 miles. What's that? About eight, nine hundred kilometers. And if you look at here again, uh, it's a little bit dated, but on the left hand side, you can see chart showing many of the flights paths that go over top of the Arctic. You can see uh, various air rescue SAR facilities uh, spread out across the top of, of Russia. And uh, very few in, in a lot in Norway uh, and very few in, for the rest of us. And to the right hand side, a little more dated, but it's an interesting chart shows some of the maritime incidents, which were a combination of collisions, uh, ice damage, uh, uh, fires, machinery breakdowns, all the other misfortunes that apply in life and uh, the vessel sinking. And you can see, although they're clustered in many areas, there is over a big area. And again, it's all uh, uh, quite a ways away from many of the normal population bases. I go to an incident off India and some of the people attending this conference will probably know more about this than I do. 
And of course, in 2017, the cyclone went through. A lot of fishing vessels were in distress. And you can see multiple uh, rescue units attended, uh, sea and air. And uh, going to the next page here, we have uh, the uh, we we have a helicopter rescuing some people, both from a, a raft and from an upturned vessel. And at one stage, it was reported 700 fishermen were missing. And I trust the eventual outcome was much better. I wasn't able to find that. Maybe somebody would like to tell me what the outcome was. So how can you provide an effective search and rescue response capability? Well, fixed wing aircraft can provide a fast and effective search capability, and have, but have limited ability to provide rescue. They can deploy life rafts with the hope that they drift to the people who are hopefully in a position to help themselves. Helicopters can provide a relatively fast and effective search capability and a rescue capability, but they have limited range, limited time on scene, and limited survival capacity. capacity. Ships can provide search and rescue, but at limited speed, and of course is severely reduced in heavy weather. They have limited breadth of search track because of the height of the bridge or crow's nest and, and the other problems there, especially if there's heavy weather. They may have difficulties in rescuing persons in the water and survivors from life rafts and lifeboats, and that was amply, sadly demonstrated by the Estonia case in 1994, where very few of the people were rescued by ship, most were rescued by helicopter in conjunction with ships. And of course, the ships may be unable to reach survivors inshore in other treacherous areas. Uh, and uh, there's many side cases of what happened there. So what potential roles could remotely controlled marine craft have? Well, they could direct air deployed life rafts to the persons in the water, a term we're using, rather than relying on them to drift to those persons or having those persons try to reach them. Uh, it could provide out of water protection to persons, particularly important in all water temperatures, but in, in the polar water temperatures where your survival time and your dexterity time is very limited. Uh, it could provide an on-scene uh, on communication hub so that there re retains communication and uh, can provide a radar AIS target for aircraft or ships so that they can find the people in distress much better. Could marshal life rafts together so they're not all drifting around in an uncontrolled pattern. And of course, could also try to keep them off from drifting ashore into dangerous waters. Could marshal, try to keep persons in the water together. <clears throat> it could assist persons of water in near shore areas, dangerous environments, other places not safely accessible to other rescue assets. Could provide a plan B for search and rescue personnel deployed from aircraft, and there's many very, these very brave people, Sartex and in the United States, uh, PJs, who do jump out of aircraft to go try to help others, and I guess there really isn't a plan B for them, and it could have other roles. Here's a little infographic we made showing a plane flying over top, it's deployed a raft and an attached to small remotely controlled craft is being parachuted down. <clears throat> you can see another craft towing a raft that's shown inflated for, for uh, information purposes anyways, uh, illustration purposes I should say, and it shows them going towards some person in the water. What kind of basic requirements should there be? Well, certainly it should be robust and fit for purpose, right? It should be able to be de deployed from a height without degrading its working capabilities and suffering physical damage to the hull, loss of buoyancy, damaging the working components, internal, external, uh, hopefully without excessive r repairs or maintenance in the long run, although many people would consider these a uh, single use craft. Uh, we suggest a minimum able to drop it effectively 20 meters from a helicopter, 30 meters. And I understand these numbers have in fact been used in practice. And of course you could deploy with a, a parachute and uh, operational impacts much the same list. 
seekeeping. Um, full operation, we suggest up to sea state four, reduced operation sea state six, and restricted operation survival, whatever, you know, up as far as you go. Depends a lot. Sea state, as we know, depends where you are, many other factors. And uh, that, that those numbers also apply. A small one from a small helicopter would have less requirements than a, a larger one from an aircraft. <clears throat> Duration of the time on the scene, we suggested from a helicopter four hours at low speed. Many of these craft have very short uh, normal operating times, but at higher speeds. And uh, so from fixed wing aircraft, we suggested a minimum for small aircraft, a minimum of eight hours, large aircraft, 48 hours. All this is very dependent on the operational scenario. Speed towing capacity. Well, we felt that endurance and thrust should be prioritized over speed because you're basically being deployed near the place of the incident um, and being there and able to operate for a longer time and perhaps to tow a life raft or deliver a line from a vessel to uh, another ship might be more useful. The towing ability, again, okay, one or two life rafts. Size, weight, deployment from a helicopter, small aircraft, light enough to pick it up and de deploy it by hand. You may simply lower it or drop it from a helicopter at low altitude, deploy with a parachute with perhaps an optional life raft system. From an aircraft could be larger, heavier parachute game with an optional life raft system. Assistance to persons in the water. Well, they could take hold of the craft. There could be some grab straps, other things to give them temporary flotation so that other rescue can arrive. Uh, that's certainly the philosophy where they're used for beach rescue. Uh, you would have some provide flotation, life rafts or other means of out of water protection, thermal protection, so that the person can get over the water, stop the heat loss, re retain their dexterity and uh, extend the survival time. Could be a mechanism to assist partially incapacitated persons. Um, Certainly a lot of additional research can be done into this. There's been some things and, you know, this is going to be a best efforts process because you're not going to help everybody, but you're going to hopefully help some. Could be a communications hub again, radar, AS target, other functions like that. A, a issue of retrieval, retrieval by ship. There could be some arrangements for, you know, to be able to a lifting frame or some mechanism. When you bring it on board, do you simply bring do you try to bring some of the survivors with it? Do you try to just bring them alongside the ship and then provide other means, other means to assist them on board have to be provided? Uh, similar issues apply to, let's say, retrieval by a helicopter, obviously very different practical problems. Control communications. Again, options depending on the size and the usage, the purpose of this craft. Line of sight radios are common with the very small ones, uh, potentially over the horizon, broadband radio, satellites. Degree of autonomy. Well, generally we're thinking of remote control. Somebody's actually controlling this. There could be temporary autonomy. I gather some where they go into the trough of a wave, may lose their line of sight radio communication, so they have some autonomy for a few seconds. Could, in theory, have some autonomous operation. Operator control. Well, generally it's a visual control from the ship or the shore, as we note below, could be from an overhead aircraft, which then gets rid of some of the wave problems. Onboard camera, allowing first person view where you have, you know, the operator can see as if he was on board the small craft. Uh, suggested because of these are, are very small craft and with limited height of view, this may not be very uh, effective. And as we noted, they could work overhead with aircraft drones that number one, provide the operator with a good view of the situation and does perhaps in, improve considerably the uh, communication. There's several examples. So we, uh, we have contacted many companies in this field and we talked to three that have craft or in kind of the air size we're talking about, which are or or say it could be uh, deployed from helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, they, these 
craft have a range of capabilities, speed, endurance, sea keeping, out of water protection for the uh, survivor and rescuee. Uh, the weight of the craft, electric versus internal combustion engine propulsion, control and comm systems, etc. The electric versions tend to have a very limited speed, range, endurance. The manufacturers advise that, in fact, especially the uh, range and endurance could be upgraded to suit the user requirements and, of course, the user's budget. So remotely controlled vehicles are rapidly uh, progressing market. Th these are indebted solely as examples of some small and very small remotely controlled marine craft. So from the United States, we picked this first one, the GARC, the Greeno Advanced Rescue Craft. It's 12 to 14 feet in length. It's, it can be manned, uh, of course you know, it's, there are military versions and uh, SAR versions. Uh, it can be optionally manned. Uh, it can be air deployed. They don't believe that they've ever done the two in the same craft. However, they advise that this is all feasible. Uh, various control communication modes. It could be an air a base for air deployed search and rescue personnel, communications hub. It's shown with the talons, which is a, there's, it's an acronym for basically a kite that takes your antenna and your search camera up a thousand to fifteen hundred feet in the air and uh, so that could assist a great deal with the extended communication it could provide shelter warmth for personnel and uh, one of the things that has because it's got an internal combustion engine it has a water uh, discharge and there's a water discharge on deck so try to keep you warm uh emily and a related craft by hydronics <clears throat> deployed, showing being deployed from helicopter. They say it has been deployed commonly up to 20 meters in height, 60 feet, and uh, deployed in a country in Southeast Asia uh, up to a height of about 90 feet, let's say around 30 meters. Could be deployed with a parachute and an attached life raft. There's a version there showing it carrying a life jacket. And there are larger versions that have uh, internal combustion engines and, uh, and you know, extended capabilities. And now the Emily itself is quite small and weighs only about 15 kilos. Uh, we have another product here, uh, the air deploy here, the USAFE, which is actually uh, based originally from Portugal. It's uh, rep represented again around the world, and there are other similar products from China, other countries with very similar characteristics. So it's they call it a self-propelled, remotely controlled life buoy. State is being deployable from helicopter. I know there's an investigation as we speak into deploying it from a small SAR jet with a parachute and a small raft, rather than deploying just a raft uh, and an extended line. Uh, control communication systems we show commercially available here in line of sight. It has first person view and slightly smaller craft. Uh, we show the Konsberg systems of the maritime broadband radio and has an extended range of capability of linking a variety of units together. And of course, there could be a satellite system with the intended costs and uh, and uh, technical complexity. But again, there's a range of capabilities depending on what you want, want to intend to use it for and what you're prepared to pay in your infrastructure. And just as a conclusion then, so maritime incidents will continue to occur with potentially tragic results in remote regions. These can be made worse by limited rescue resources, cold water temperatures, related factors, Although aircraft can often search for and find the location of the persons in distress in a much, in a reasonable period of time, rescue can take much longer. Air deployed remotely controlled marine craft may be able to assist in the rescue phase. And this presentation is intended to raise awareness of the potentials and some of the issues. It's up to the search and rescue authorities and industry to provide 
solution. I show there a picture from the Estonia disaster in 1994 in the Baltic. And I attended a spoke at a mass rescue conference in Gothenburg in 2012. A Swedish member of parliament was there. He spent the night on upturned life raft with 20 people. When they were finally rescued in the morning by a helicopter, um, where three of them survived. And as they said, all night there were ships in the area steaming around and uh, they were more concerned of, or an issue of concern than of safety. I'm just a little finished. So a final thought. In the continuum of rescue response, which ranges from nothing to being in the emergency room of a major medical facility, a remotely controlled surface craft would likely fall somewhere between nothing and a manned rescue boat. However, to a person in the water, the remotely controlled surface craft would most likely appear to be a massive improvement over nothing. I'd like to thank you for your attention, acknowledge your assistance from numerous members of industry, SAR organizations, government, and the university, and in particular of my assistant there, Tara Sherrard. And that's my contacts.